Welcome everyone to the Daniel Krug and Associates Wealth Management Review for June 25, 2020. Today's presentation is titled Bumps in the Road. My name is Rocky Istvan. I'm the Chief Compliance Officer and Associate Wealth Manager at Daniel Krug and Associates. Daniel Krug will be joining me. He is the CEO and Senior Wealth Manager at Daniel Krug and Associates and we will be doing the presentation today. Just a reminder that this presentation is for informational and illustrative purposes only and should not be considered investment or tax advice. If you have questions specific to your situation, please call the office and we will set you up with a meeting and get you those answers. Today we're gonna to cover uh, some of the major developments that has happened over the past week, an update on COVID-19, reopening and unemployment, the markets and investing. Dan's gonna highlight a strategy that we use in the office. And again, we'll do Q&A at the end. A reminder of what wealth management means to us. There's basically five major components, things that we work on for our clients. And it all begins with the investment strategy. You've gotta know what your investment plan looks like. It's gotta be customized to your specific goals and needs. And most companies do this part of wealth management. Some do it better than others, but it's only one of the five uh, strategies that we walk you through. The other things we do is in the area of advanced planning, where we get into wealth enhancement strategies, wealth transfer strategies, wealth protection strategies. And I would say about a third of our clients are charitably inclined, and we have many strategies that maximize the tax impact of and savings of charitable giving. So each one of those strategies is customized to your specific giving needs and wishes, so, and to minimize taxes. Today, we're gonna to be focusing in on a wealth enhancement strategy, talking about Roth conversions, and that will be coming in just a little bit. So let's go on to the major developments for this week. We actually have some data that has come out from some major universities, MIT, Harvard, Berkeley, McKinsey, and we're gonna present some of that data today. So that is new and uh, kind of got some good information to give you. Um, the rising case spreading indicates that states still need to adopt proven policies and protocols based on what we've learned. And again, a lot of that information is just coming out to reinforce some of the things we're doing and we're gonna to touch on that. Uh, the reopening is continuing with most states progressing without an undue rise in cases. So even though you're hearing a lot in the news, most states are not having issues and we're gonna cover that. Fatalities and hospitalizations continue to decline globally. That's really important to know because overseas, China, Europe, they started up before us and they're continuing to progress and see declining numbers. So while they're opening up and operating, those numbers are continuing to go down. And then we're gonna talk about the economic activity um, that is rebounding in not only the US, but Europe and Asia. And we believe that looking back at the data, because the economy has picked up, that they're actually gonna call an end to this recession around the end of May, beginning of June timeframe. So from there, let me give you a little update on uh, COVID over the last week and the information that we've received. First of all, um, with the numbers, most states continue to see a decline in hospitalizations versus a week ago. However, in saying that, we have seen an acceleration in Texas and Arizona. If you look at the chart, Wherever the bars are going up above the zero line, that means there's been an increase. Wherever they're going down, that is a decrease. So basically, um, Texas saw about a thousand uh, hospitalization increase last week. Arizona saw about 500. California, less than 200. Now, all those are numbers to be concerned about, if you look at it in relation to the tens of millions of populations of these states, the numbers are still very small. So the question is, 
well, if hospitalizations are increasing, what's happening at the hospitals? And that's what this chart shows. Basically, from the beginning of tracking hospitalizations back in the beginning of or middle of April through last week, we see on the left side of this graph the capacity of available capacity at hospitals. So from zero to 100%, the yellow line represents 30% capacity, which means you need to pay attention to those numbers. 50% capacity is a warning sign. And yet when you look at the states, Arizona, California, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Texas, the only one that's significantly showing a trend up is Arizona. That has breached the 30% available capacity in their hospitals, okay? So keep in mind, 70% of the capacity is still available, okay? But it entered that caution area because it's an increase in a trend that we haven't quite seen in other places. So um, Arizona is an area of concern, and you're hearing this in the news, but understand it's not getting in the area of available capacity. Plus, also keep in mind that additional capacity contingency plans were put into place if we ever breached 100%. So this isn't counting any of that available capacity that we could go to other facilities, other resources and things like that, that were actually planned out way back at the peak of this. So this is just current available hospital capacity and things seem to be well in line, except for we gotta watch what's going on in Arizona. Um, we brought this in because uh, Florida has been in the news a lot because there's been an acceleration in the positive test rate in Florida. Now understand that they have increased testing significantly in Florida. And whenever we increase testing, we're going to get more cases, right? Positive test results. But when we look at these two charts, what you see on the left chart is what's happened over the last week or two with the positive test rate. It has jumped up significantly, up from 4% up to a little over 10%, 11%, right? So there's been a huge increase in the positive test rate. However, if you put that in relationship to how many of those people have been hospitalized, that's the chart on the right. And basically what it's shown, while there was an increase over the last couple of weeks in hospitalizations, it's still nowhere near where Florida was a month ago. Okay, so the, what, what does that mean when the people that are testing positive is going up, but the hospitalizations are not increasing at the same rate? It means that people are fighting this disease off without major, major medical treatment. They're able to stay at home or whatever and get over the virus. So that's a good sign. More people that are being tested isn't equating to having to go to the hospital as a critical illness and be treated for it. So I think that's a pretty good thing to see happening. Um, now, this study just came out last week. This is a study by MIT. And what they did is they took the hypothesis of, is it possible to achieve safety results of lockdowns, of a complete lockdown with a different or more targeted approach to the problem, okay? Because if you get locked down, obviously there's no economy going on. It stagnates the economy, right? And so what the bars represent, starting on the left, is the first bar is a lengthy total lockdown, meaning this was the worst case, everything shuts down, and what's the cost of that to the economy? That's an $8 trillion cost to our economy. Well, our national annual GDP is only 21, 22 billion or trillion, so that is over a third of our GDP gone for the year. The next bar over, says, well, what if we just shut down? And again, this was a study with data to back this. What if we did a targeted or semi shutdown? What's the cost of that? About 5.4 trillion in GDP. What about the next part? This is what happens if you would do group distancing. 
again, you would reduce the cost of this program, this, this virus, down to 3.6 trillion. The next bar is improved testing and isolation. Again, reducing the cost, okay, against uh, the economy. What happens in the last, last bar, the 1.5 trillion cost is if you combine group distancing with improved testing and isolation. <laughs> Struggle with that word. Um, so basically what it's saying is you can cut the cost in half by cut it, grouping this group distancing and improved testing and isolation measures put in place. And yet it's not nearly the cost of a total lockdown. But the most interesting part of this study is that everything resulted in a mortality rate of 0.20%. So what their original premise said is that if we did a total lockdown and it cost the economy $8 trillion, you would still have a 0.2% mortality rate versus all the way over to only a fraction of that cost by combining group distancing and improved testing and isolation, you still would only have a 0.2% mortality rate. So that is significant. All these strategies, and this is what MIT research is proving out, is that you can do these strategies that are less than a total lockdown and still get the results of the lowest mortality rate, which 0.2% is still high. It's double regular flu season, but significantly at a less cost to the economy um, moving forward. So very good information, very good research being done to help us figure out how in the future to deal with these situations.